Okay. <laughs> now that we're recording, it's what I predicted on Wednesday has happened. The technology has failed us. So like I said, I was hoping you could bring a computer like some of you have and follow along with my lecture as I just sat here and did it. That wasn't being projected. But not only is it not being projected, but my internet's down. So, and this would work, but I don't have my plug in. I have to set it on my dock in my office. So I'm about to go to my office. I'm going to do my lecture from the office. For those of you who are here in person, you're going to get extra credit for being here. The rest of you will just do things as normal. So I'm going to get online as soon as I can, as soon as I'm done taking attendance. I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to do the lecture. Um, and if you're watching live, you're going to send me those keywords like you normally would. And, uh, and I know this sucks for you guys because if you don't have time to go get to a computer, then you're going to have to watch the video, in which case you'll have to follow those directions, you know, like take the screenshot of the words and all that. We're good. I'm so sorry. I don't know. Someone told me, too, that it was working. I really thought it might be. And like I said, it just got worse. So let me take a – let's see who's here. Van Cross, Taylor, Michaela. Let's see. Okay. Reed, Redmond, Hemmings, Bowers, Asbury, Tudor. Yep. Felder. Hudson, Burdett, Newton, Massey, Richardson, uh, Cedric, Rice, and wearing red, even more extra credit, um, Polly, Butler, Midkiff in red, almost a song, uh, Eric, Sippel is here, Hodges, David, Sharp. I know I skip people here. Uh, where are we at? Massey's here. Um, and Kinsey. Or excuse me, Kinsey, right? All right. So I have everybody. For those of you online, you can just stand by for a couple of seconds while I slide into my office. For the rest of you, I really apologize. And like I said, at least you get extra credit for this. Um, so I guess watch, watch the stream. I'd invite you all to my office, but there's no room. I really, really, really am sorry. So the good news is it's Friday. So if you don't have any other classes, you can just leave and watch the video later and start your weekend. It's up to you. I'm so sorry. All right, are you online people? Uh, bear with me as I reset up in my office. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please let me know. And also in the meantime, it's a good time to remind you, um, uh, excuse me, Monday is the exam. It's all mine. No one needs to be here on Monday um, because the exam is all mine. Um, it starts at 8. You have to close it out at 8.50. On Monday, someone's going to say, I forgot the exam was on, was today, or I didn't know the exam was today. So, me, I'm saying it yet again and again and again. And also, um, if you don't mind, maybe you could tell your classmates, um, remind them, because some of you are friends, some of you are teammates. Remind them that the exam is on Monday, and if they miss it, it's a, it's a zero. Anyway, um, like I said, I'm setting things up here in my office. In the meantime, if you have questions, let me know. Now, I won't even do the first attendance word yet because you guys aren't missing anything yet. So let's see here. Dun, 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 chapter, five. chapter five, PowerPoint. Let 
I've got it pulled up. I just need to open it. So to remind you also while I'm opening this up, um, this is chapter five. This is the first chapter of exam two. So what we're covering right now is not obviously not going to be in this first exam, this exam we're having on Monday. This is going to be on exam two. It's opening slowly. There we go. Okay, so that's your current slide. There we go. All right. Um, one second. Almost there, guys. I really do apologize. So it should be pulled up. Can someone please confirm? Oh, not yet. Sorry. There we go. Can someone please online confirm that you can hear me and that you can see the PowerPoint? Good. Thumbs up works. Thank you, guys. All right. Here we go. Let me pull this back up. Um, so now that we are officially up and running, let me go ahead and give you the first attendance word. And the first attendance word is going to be pizza, because right there it is, right? And yesterday was National Pizza Day. So the first attendance word is pizza. So um, if you're online, send me those words, um, you know, before 9 a.m. If you're watching this live, um, if you are watching the video, send me uh, either a screenshot of that pizza or a different picture of pizza. Anyway, let's get into it. Finally, sorry about this, guys. Again, we are starting chapter five. You'll notice we skipped chapter four. I would recommend reading it. Obviously, I'm not going to test you on it because I'm skipping it. But basically, chapter four tells you how a cell works in general. And the reason I'm skipping it, um, other than the fact that we're sort of under a time constraint, um, there's a lot of chapters we need to skip, um, is because the next, let's see, three, one, two, three, four, five, at least the next five chapters that we're going to cover, actually, that's all about what cells do, right? So chapter four is an overview of what cells do. And then we get, spe then we get specific about it. Like, so for example, this one, as you can see, the name of this um, chapter is called Why Cellular Functions Matter. So we're really going to dig into some cellular functions. And then we're going to talk specifically about photosynthesis and specifically about respiration and specifically about... Um, a cellular reproduction. So that's the reason why we're skipping chapter four. You are going to learn about cells through these other chapters. Um, so anyway, that being said, yes, this one is about cellular uh, functions. Obviously, this is a picture of actually, you know what, we're running behind. So I'm not going to do the, the normal guessing game that I would. It's a little bit of fun, but we don't have time to do it thanks to technology problems. I'll also point out that every chapter of your textbook starts with this biology and society, and I skip it every time to save time. As always, I recommend reading it and coming to me if you have questions about it. Um, but I'm not going to test you on it. There might be questions on the study guide, but there won't be any questions on the exam. And they, uh, speaking of which, it's a good time to remind you, if you haven't done the study guides for chapters one, two, and three, do them over the weekend. I get this every year. People at the end of the semester be like, oh, I did bad because, you know, I'm bad at testing. And you, you can't use that excuse if you didn't do the study guides, right? The study guides, it's the bare minimum you could do. That's what I used to wrote the, write the exam. So if you didn't if you didn't do the study guides I used to write the exams, then you might not be bad at testing. You might not be bad at science. You might just be lazy. I hate to be tough about it, but I've seen it every year. And everybody's quiet until the end of the semester where there's always a handful of people who are all of a sudden concerned about their grades. Anyway, um, if anything that you need to know from this, and we're going to talk about it more in the chapter, is this thing called ATP. So there's your little preview. ATP is what we're going to talk about um, later. You're going to learn all about it. It's really important. Um, and the chapter thread, not that it matters for testing purposes, but just a little heads up, it's going to keep coming up, is nanotechnology, which is basically really, really tiny technology. So here we go. If you're taking notes, you could write this down. If you had to sum up, all right, so remember in chapter one, we talked about life's properties, right? And then I said, basically, this whole semester, we're going to be talking about the different life properties. Um, and then this one, actually, this whole exam, but especially this chapter, this whole next exam, exam two, the, the property of life that this is really discussing is 
the conversion of energy, right? Life needs energy. Life converts energy from one form to another. And that's basically what this exam two is going to be about. So chapters five, six, and seven, all about energy. Um, and then this chapter, we're going to give you an overview. You're going to have some a basic understanding of what, standing of what energy is. And then we're going to talk about why cells need it. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, in the next chapters, we'll talk about how they get it more specifically. So here we go. Any questions so far? All right. So let's talk about what energy is. Is anybody, can anybody guess um, or tell me how, what you think the, the, the definition of energy is? And I know that's a tough one because we all kind of know what energy is. But here you are in a biology class and now I'm asking you for the definition. And I think that makes it a little bit tougher. But try to imagine you're not in a biology class and some little kid says, what is energy? Anybody have a guess? That's all right. This is something you need to know for the exam. Energy is the capacity to cause change. So know that bullet point right there. Energy is the capacity to cause change. Um, and then your book gets a little bit, you know, you just uh, expands on that a little bit uh, with this next bullet point. Some forms of energy are used to perform work, like, right, right. this guy's rolling a, a boulder up a hill. Um, so, you know, that would be moving an object against an opposing force. So, again, energy is the capacity to cause change. That's the most important bullet point. And, yes, um, some forms of it are used to perform work. And in a sense, even though I'm not going to test you on the second bullet point, that second bullet point's what matters for this um, this chapter, right? Because cells need to perform work. And we're going to talk about what kind of work they perform and where they get their energy and stuff like that. So any questions about what energy is? All right, next. This one should be easy. Hopefully someone can guess this because you've probably heard this your whole life. Can anyone tell me the two types of energy? There's two basic types of energy. Any guesses? Nobody? Not even for extra credit? All right. Here we go. The first type is, whoops, let's go back here. Kinetic energy. And you need to know, first of all, you need to know the differences between the two. Um, and again, so keep that in mind as I move forward. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? So and I'm going to talk about this in more detail later. But one example from that that's a, not, an, a, not an obvious example is the temperature, you know, the temperature of the air. And I've used that example before in lecture. When I say the heat is increased in a room, right, if I crank the heat up on the thermostat, what I really am saying at a molecular level is the kinetic energy is increasing, right? The air molecules are moving faster. That is the energy of motion. So now that I've told you one of the two types, surely somebody can guess the second type of energy because surely you've heard these two together. No guesses. All right. Potential energy is the second one. Um, and basically, as far as you're concerned, potential energy is stored energy. So again, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And potential energy is stored energy. So, um, you know, think about a bow and arrow. If, when you pull the string back, that has a lot of potential energy, right? It's not moving. I mean, it is when you pull it. But once it's pulled back and you're not moving, that's a lot of potential energy. That's stored energy. Then you let go of it, the arrow shoots forward, and then it, that becomes kinetic energy. Here's where it gets a little bit more complicated and a little bit more important for you guys. When we're talking about potential energy, it gets that stored energy due to location and structure. And location is probably the one that you grow up learning about. So, for example, you know, this is going to be horrible. This is why I wish we were in person right now. If that's a building and then that's a building and there's two people at the top of the buildings, I'm not going to try to draw a person. <laughs> Just draw a stick with a head with a circle, right? And they each have a 10-pound bowling ball, and they're going to drop it from the from the top, right? That's what they're going to do. But at the moment, they haven't dropped it yet. So then the question, and I'm not going to ask you guys because apparently nobody wants to talk because no one gets kinetic and potential energy. But I would ask you if anybody was in a talking mood, which one has more potential energy, A or B? And the answer, as I'm sure you've learned in many, many science classes, is B, right? Because of its location, because it's higher, that um, bowling ball would have more kinetic energy. That we're all familiar with, I'm sure. Where it gets a little less obvious is this one. And unfortunately, the less obvious one is the one that we are focused on in this semester, in this course. Like I've said, uh, I brought this up when we talked in Chapter 2. 
about um, chemistry in general. And then uh, chapter three, I brought it up when we talked about specific biological molecules. And I'm really going to really going to talk about it a lot in this chapter. The however much energy it takes to build something, that's how much energy will be released when we when you break it, essentially. So especially when we're talking about molecules, which is the only thing I'm talking about in this context, however much energy it takes to build a molecule, right, to squish those atoms together, that's how much energy will can be released when you break those chemical bonds, right? So that's what we mean by the potential energy um, stored in structure. Because as far as we're concerned, we don't really talk much about potential energy due to location, not in this class. It's all about the structure, right? It's all about that molecular structure, those chemical bonds. And what I didn't tell you in chapter two and chapter three, when we were talking about um, chemical bonds, is I didn't tell you that some bonds form easier than others. Um, sometimes it takes a lot of energy to form a chemical bond. And again, the more energy it takes to form that chemical bond, the more energy will be released. Um, there's nothing to write down yet for that. Just keep that in the back of your mind when we move forward and start talking about some of these things. All right, so are there any questions about the two types of energy? All right, um, I guess since we just talked about it, the next word for attendance will be bowling ball. So again, if you're live streaming this and you're with me right now, before 9 a.m., send me the keyword bowling ball along with the other ones that I give you. Before 9 a.m., anything after that, you'll be considered late. If you're watching the video as opposed to watching this as a live stream, then send me a picture of a bowling ball along with the other things that I've asked you to send pictures of. Anyway, moving forward, here's something else you probably, um, I hope you're very familiar with. I'm sure you've heard this throughout um, throughout your life and you know at least K through 12 is something called the conservation of energy. It's a very simple concept, at least at this level of education, but it's very important, so make sure you understand it. Energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed, right? Energy cannot be destroyed, it cannot be created. So then what happens? It can only be converted from one form to another. And I'll just go ahead and give you a, a preview here, a little hint. There will be a test question where it says something like, you know, or maybe it's a, no, it might be, it might be a question in the lab. Anyway, the question is something like, you know, in photosynthesis, do the leaves create energy or do they convert it from one form to another? Right. And this, that's the answer. The answer is they converts it from, well, I'll go ahead and tell you, from solar energy to chemical energy. But you cannot create or destroy energy. Right. It's just converted from one form to another. So when you're this electricity that I'm using right now, that's a form of energy. Right. The electricity that I'm using uh, to run this computer to give you this lecture. It was not created. It was just converted. Right. It was converted. Like there was chemical energy in that coal which was then burnt, which was then turned to thermal energy, and that heated up water, and that that would cause steam, and that steam turned to turbine, which means that uh, thermal energy was also turned into a kinetic slash mechanical energy, and then that was turned into an electrical energy, so on and so forth. So I know I keep talking about something very simple, um, but it's a very important concept. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. And that brings us, even though I've already said it, to this bullet point here, which just states why are we spending a whole chapter talking about this? Basically because it is one of the um, properties of life. Life depends on the conversion of energy from one form to another. I think I said it in one of our earlier lectures. I don't actually, I don't remember if it was you, you guys or not, but you guys all need energy, right? You're using energy right now because you're alive, right? So you are using energy. Um, specifically, as you're going to learn later in this chapter, you are using ATP energy to create, um, or you're creating ATP energy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But yes, your cells are using something called ATP, but that you had to make some conversions to make that, right? Ultimately, all the energy in the universe, or excuse me, ultimately all the all the energy on Earth for living things came from the sun with a few exceptions. Um, and you guys, when you need energy, it's not like you can just go out and lay out naked in front of the sun, right? Even though that's ultimately where the energy, energy came from, it doesn't work that way. You have to eat things to get energy. Um, but ultimately the energy in those things came from the sun. And we will talk about that later. So are there any questions about this slide while I take a sip of coffee? All right, the next slide is basically a picture that kind of shows the relationship between kinetic and potential energy. In this system, in this particular example, you know, again, we're talking about, I don't know why your book chose this as an example, 
because it's all about location. But um, anyway, at this point in, in this system, this person has the greatest potential energy, right? Because that's as high as they're going to get. And unless you assume maybe they bounce a little bit. But anyway, let's just assume this is as high as they're going to get. That means they have their greatest potential energy. And when they're just standing there, not there, but if they were standing right here and not moving, they would have zero kinetic energy, right? They would have potential energy, but zero kinetic energy. But then when they jump off at that point, you know, they're moving. So that is when their potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy, right? It's not kinetic energy wasn't created when they jumped. It was being converted from one form to another. Then this person belly flops onto the water um, and they no longer have kinetic energy. They now have potential energy. But again, it's the least amount of potential energy because that unless they go underwater, this is as low as they're going to get. So again, that energy was not created or destroyed, it's converted from one form to another. And if you guys were in a talking mood, I would ask you, you know, what happens when someone hits the water? And so hopefully somebody would say, well, there'd be a splash and you could see it and you could hear it. And that would also be um, that kinetic energy being converted, you know, to different things. The, the, the kinetic energy of the human falling would be converted into um, sound energy, which is vibrations of the air. Um, and that's also kinetic energy. So anyway, any questions about this, this slide? If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video that talks about energy concepts. Um, I already have a good one for you. I think it's a good one. Um, and I'll share that with you later this weekend. Actually, I might share it with you next week so you can focus on the exam this weekend. But, um, Anyway, you can watch that this video if you want. It talks about the energy concepts, but I'll share one with you later. All right. So, again, we're still talking about some basic energy concepts. We talked about the conservation of energy. We did, we defined the two different types of energy. Now we're going to talk about heat. And I already brought this up, but now we're going to officially discuss it. Um, I would ask you what it is, but I think everybody's being quiet today. But as I already said, heat, as you need to know, is a type of kinetic energy. And specifically, um, it's, a, you know, again, it is a type of kinetic energy, but specifically, it's the random motion of matter. Um, and you don't have to memorize that verbatim. First of all, I might not even ask it. And second of all, if I do, it won't be verbatim. Like You need to remember those exact words. Just remember the concept. Like I said, when I say it's getting hotter in this room, what I mean at the molecular level is that the molecules are moving faster. Um as a matter of fact, that's what this little star is for, is because I will use the word matter, um, but your book uses the term atoms and molecules. So your book says heat is a type of kinetic energy, uh, and it is the random motion of atoms and molecules, which is true. Um, anyway, so are there any questions about what heat is? All right, I'm not going to ask you this, but I'm going to mention it briefly because your book mentions it. Um, heat is the most chaotic and disordered form of energy, which is an important concept if you're really, really diving into physics, uh, but we're not. Not only is this a 100 level course, and, but it's a biology course and it's a biology course for non-biology majors. So as far as, we're, as far as I'm concerned, you can completely forget that bullet point and completely understand everything I'm going to teach you this semester. So, and again, I, I teach out of the book, so it, it mentioned it, so did I. Here's one that you do need to know, though. This will be important later in the semester. Um, all energy conversions generate some heat. So think in, in your head about that person who was jumping off the diving board and landing on the water. Even though you don't, you wouldn't feel it. You could probably not barely even. You probably couldn't even detect it unless you had some really um, fancy equipment. But when that person hit the water, that generated some heat. Um, and there'll be a there's a question on the study guide where it talks about something about like somebody's on a bicycle and they apply the brakes to their bicycle so right so they're converting you know they're getting rid of their kinetic energy so to speak and then the, the something like what happens to the energy and one of the options is it was released as heat and yes that is the answer right because when you convert energy from one form to another it um it produces heat so know those two bullet points right no bullet point one bullet point two entropy I'm going to put a big old X to this because, again, if we were looking at things, even a, a real chemistry class and obviously a real physics class, entropy would be important because when you look at these things mathematically, which we're not, there's equations, right? There, We have equations for chemical reactions and not just the ones that say 
you know, product plus product equals reactant, right? We have equations that involve temperature and different types of energy and all the energy has to be accounted for from the beginning to the, of the reaction to the end, because sometimes it requires an input of energy. Sometimes it puts out energy either way. Um, mathematically, when you're looking at these things, entropy is very important. Um, but we don't look at these mathematically. We're not looking at those equations. Therefore, you guys don't need to worry about entropy. I'll go ahead and tell you what the book says. Entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness in a system. And every time energy is converted from one form to another, entropy increases. So I'm telling you that because the book told you that. Um, but it's not really an important concept for you guys. Again, you can understand everything I teach you for the rest of this semester without understanding what entropy is. Um, but if you are a deep thinker, because entropy can be kind of complicated when you really start digging into it. But if you are a deep thinker and want to look into it, look up entropy if you want to write some independent work papers about it. Um, but that's up to you. Any questions about this slide? Heat and entropy. All right. Now we're starting getting a little bit more important stuff. It gets a little bit more and more important. And by important, I mean in the context of this um, this course. So you do, the next thing you need to understand is very important chemical energy. You need to know what chemical energy is. So I already said that there's two basic types of energy, potential energy and kinetic energy. And those are the basic types, but there's obviously all kinds of other energy, right? Chemical energy, mechanical energy, electrical energy, light energy, uh, sound energy, all these different types. And they all fall under um, potential and kinetic. But so now here we are talking about chemical energy and chemical energy is a form of potential energy. That's the first thing you need to know. And in a sense, I already told you about that. So when I talked about potential energy and we talked about the difference between, you know, that potential energy is stored due to its location or due to its structure. Um, well, now I'm just going back to you and telling you again, with chemical energy, that's what we're talking about with the structure. It is, this chemical energy is due to the arrangement of atoms and it can be released by chemical reactions, which is just a formal way of saying what I already told you a few minutes ago, which is that however much energy it takes to build an, a molecule, right, to squeeze those atoms together, that's how much energy will be released when you break those chemical bonds. So if it takes a lot of energy to build a molecule, it's going to release a lot of energy. If it only takes a little bit of energy, then it's only going to release a little bit of energy. All right, so now this picture might look goofy, but there it is for a reason. And I know you guys aren't talking, but I'm going to ask this because I hope to God somebody knows it because you're going to get at it. It's going to be on the exam on Monday. Um, if we're talking about uh, electrons, right, what charge do electrons have? Negative. Yay. Who was that, Daniel? Yeah. Hey, good job. If I can remember, I'll give you a little extra credit for answering. Um, yes, electrons have a negative charge. Let's also remember that when we, and again, this isn't exactly accurate, but when we drew those molecules, uh, you know, we had the, the rings. There's an inner ring or an outer ring. I'm just going to go ahead and draw on our carbon since we talk about it so much. And I'm only going to draw the four outer electrons. But anyway, those electrons are on the outside, right? So on the outside of these atoms she's yeah on the outside of these atoms are these electrically charged things so imagine you're trying to bring two and here i'll just draw hydrogen because it's easy so now i want to i want to bring this hydrogen over to this carbon or maybe bring the carbon over the hydrogen however you want to say it. it doesn't matter in this in this conversation i'm trying to bring a carbon and a hydrogen together is what i'm saying what they have they have these negative electrons on the outside and here i am trying to squeeze them together and that brings us to this picture Surely you guys have had magnets before and you tried to push them together when you had when they're not op right? when they're opposite, they stick together. Right. When they're the same, they repel each other. Well, think about that. That's what we're dealing with with these atoms, even though this isn't what I'm telling you isn't 100 percent accurate, but it is 100 percent a good way to think about it, to understand the concepts. Um, so we have these electrons on the outside. When you're trying to squeeze these things together, they're repelling each other. Right. Because you have. Negative electrons here and negative electrons here and negative things repel each other. So it's going to take this energy, right? You're going to have to put some energy into squeezing those things together. And again, however, if it takes more energy to squeeze them together, then it's going to be more energy released when you break those chemical bonds. So keep that in mind. Um, and this is another example I like to use the crossbow. Because when you think about it, it's a, you know, you pull the string back, right? And, the, and then once it's back, you have all that potential energy ready to go. And I don't know if you're familiar with crossbows or not, but 
this should be common sense in a, in a way. The harder it is to pull that string back, basically, and you could argue this in different ways, but anyway, the more, you know, the harder it is to pull it back, the more energy is ready to be released when you pull the trigger, right? So that's just chemical energy or not. It, this is representing chemical energy, right? We built this bond. We have this structure. All the energy it took to make this thing the way it is will be released when we pull the trigger. And we'll come back to that um, that idea here in a second. So anyway, are there any questions so far about what chemical energy is? All right. As we already mentioned previously in the semester, um, cells and inner engines like car engines for example they use the same basic process to make chemical energy stored in the fuel available for work um which is kind of weird when you think about it if you're not familiar with biology you might think it's different but in in very similar way and uh, very in many ways it is it is the same so here we go i've already shown you this picture before there's octane right that's the molecule that fuels vehicles uh, at least gasoline powered vehicles right there. And then here's uh, a fat, right? And you can see these fatty acids, as you need to remember for the exam, those are the fatty acids. That's the glycerol. But anyway, you can see these fatty acids, they look a lot like the octane, right? Because in a sense, you know, similar function, form, similar function, it's the same thing. So engines break that molecule down and it releases energy and that energy is used to move the vehicle. And then we break this molecule down and the energy that is released, our cells use to do work. And that's what we're going to talk about later um, in this chapter. But yeah, here's a picture of what I'm saying, right? There's the octane. You burn it in the presence of oxygen, right? So you're basically breaking these bonds, all these bonds that make that thing up. You break the bonds, that releases the energy. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, engines get hot, right? So that energy is lost energy, right? Um, because we're not trying to make a hot engine, we're trying to make a vehicle move. But in the process of converting the chemical energy into uh, mechanical energy and kinetic energy, we lose some of it as heat energy. And the same for us, right? So we here we have this glucose. You, you broke with glucose this time instead of uh, fatty acid. But either way, we're breaking these bonds in the form of oxygen, um, and we're putting that to work to make ATP. Um, and in the process, we're losing some of it as heat energy. And notice uh, for both of them, the 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 byproducts are the same. And both of them are producing carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water. Especially these days when you look at a tailpipe of a, of a vehicle, a lot of what you're seeing coming out, well, depending on the vehicle, a lot of it is just carbon dioxide and water. So it might look like smoke, but a lot of it's, you know, just steam. But anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. And I'll go ahead and give you a preview since it's up on the screen anyway. Um, if I had to paraphrase this this whole chapter into one sentence like the one thing that you need to remember from this whole chapter you know, there's a lot of things but the number one thing you should remember is this right here cells use atp as their source of energy right that's what cells use if anything if you forget everything else remember that because here's the here's whole the, the whole exam too is broken down into this chapter five cells use atp for energy Chapter six, cells break down glucose um, to make ATP, and, the, and that's the process of respiration. Chapter seven, cells use sunlight energy and convert that uh, to make glucose, right? So that's it, right? If That's the whole exam two broken down into three sentences, but we'll come back to that. Speaking of which... Cellular respiration, and again, we're going to have a whole chapter on it. That's the next chapter. Um, it is an energy-releasing chemical breakdown of fuel molecules. I'm putting it next to that just to indicate, like, if you're taking notes, there's no need to write that down yet because, again, we're going to have a whole chapter on it. This is just a preview. Um, and it stores that energy in the form that a cell can use. Again, that was the ATP I told you about earlier. And, again, we're going to talk about that next chapter, so there's no need to write that down yet. But here's a number you do need to know, and I've told you before, I'm not big on specific numbers in this course, but it, it, occasionally I am. And this is one of those that you need to know. About 34% of your food energy is converted to useful work, and the rest of it is lost as heat. So you need to know that number, about 34%. 
and this is a 100 level class, so I'm not going to try to tr be tricky, right? Your exam, your multiple choice exam, your, your choices aren't going to be 32%, 33%, 34%, or 35%, right? That wouldn't be right. It'll pro probably be more like, I don't know, 34%, 44%, 54%, or 64%. So you know, don't stress uh, memorizing the exact number, but understand that about 34% is used as uh, useful work, which when you think about it, it's a small portion of it, right? A large majority of it is just lost as heat, which is what this picture is. It's not from your textbook. That's an infrared picture. I'm sure you guys have seen movies where, you know, with night vision, where there's different types of night vision, but one of the types is infrared, which is what we see here. You can just see the heat emanating from somebody. And that's why, you know, you as humans, generally our, our temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And that's where that temperature comes from. So anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. So where does that energy come from? As I previously mentioned, it comes from food. So now we're going to talk about a concept I'm sure you're all very familiar with because you've been dealing with it your whole life. But now we're going to get really specific and you're going to learn it from a, a biological perspective. Let's talk about calories. First thing you need to know is what a calorie is. And first of all, notice this is a calorie with an under, under case C. That'll be important later. But anyway, a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So please know that. There might be one basic test question that involves this. I won't ask you for that definition, but you'll need to do this for, you know, you need to use that for some basic math. So I might ask a question like, how many calories will it take to raise... 10 grams of water by one degree Celsius. So then you're like, well, we just need to multiply it by 10. So the answer would be 10 calories. Um, or I might ask, you know, how many calories does it take to raise one gram of water by 100 degrees Celsius? And the answer would be 100 calories. You know, it's pretty basic. There'll only be one test question like that. So as you're studying it and trying to work with it, and if it's stressing you out, first of all, obviously come to me if you need help. But also beyond that, if it's really stressing you, just remember, though, if anything, there'll only be like one test question. But anyway, that's what a calorie is with a lower case C. Do, do any of you have like a, a food or a drink in front of you where you can read the label and tell us how many calories it is by any chance? I'm looking around. All right. Well, I wish you guys could see it. Um, but I do have something here. I've got some protein shake. And it says amounts per serving. All right, this has 200 calories per serving. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky for us in America because when we say calories, we're usually talking about calories with a big C. And that is indeed what my label is talking about. So it says calories. It even has a big C. Um, and what a calorie is with a big C is actually a kilocalorie. So really, when I say this thing has 200 calories, what I mean uh, in the context of this conversation, is it has 200,000 calories. So in theory, if I were to burn this protein powder, um, I could raise 200,000 grams of water by one degree Celsius. Or theoretically, uh, I could raise one gram of water by 200,000 degrees Celsius, or anywhere in between. But anyway... That's what a calorie is with a big C. So when you look at a when you look at a food label in the United States of America and some other countries too, you know, and it says calorie with a big C, keep in mind that's actually kilo calories. Um, like for example, I think most sodas are about 120 calories. Well, that's actually 120,000 calories. Anyway, that's the important stuff. And then your book, like you book through this in there, as I'm sure you know, uh, calories are the energy, or excuse me. The energy of calories are what's used to fuel the activities of life. Um, really quickly before we move forward. Actually, there's the next. We'll do that for the next attendance word. So if you're live streaming and you're with me right now, you're going to send the next word, which is burger. Um, and if you are watching the video, send me a picture of a burger. Not this picture. Not the one that's up here right now, but Google it. Any old, or take a picture of a burger if you want. Or if you want extra credit, take me out and buy me a burger. No, I'm just kidding. I get in trouble for that. But anyway, yeah, that's the next attendance word. 
This next slide, I'm not going to cover. I just threw it in there for people who like to study because remember, you can download the PowerPoints from Google Classroom. But this is just a great way of looking at, you know, the relationship between calories with a big C and kilocalories, um, which, you know, kilo means a thousand. So one calorie with a big C is one kilocalorie, which is 1000 regular calories with a small C. And then this is, I'm not going to test you on this. This is just way one way of looking mathematically at all the different ways you can describe this relationship. Um, so look at it if you want. Do not, <laughs> there's nothing to memorize here. Again, I just want you to get your brain thinking mathematically about calories. So are there any questions about this essentially useless slide, if you think about it that way? Okay. Here's an independent work topic. I mean, this is just a rough guide, um, but if you're interested, think about the favorite things you like to do and think about the favorite things you like to eat, right? So and then look that up, right? How many calories for your favorite dish uh, and how many, or how many calories are consumed for your favorite dish and how many calories are burned for your favorite activity? And notice a lot of this is sports related, like jumping jack, running, tennis, swimming, biking, walking a dog reading a newspaper, whatever. But, you know, so actually I like this too because it reminds me it doesn't have to be athletic stuff if you're into it. Like if you like to play guitar, you look that up. How many calories per hour burning uh, playing guitar or, I don't know, painting a picture. Whatever it is you're into, you can look that up for um, independent work. Don't forget your sources. But anyway, uh, before I move forward, I'll also point out that this is just a visual aid. You don't need to study this or memorize this. I'm not going to ask you how many calories are in a cheeseburger. Um, for one thing, it depends on the cheeseburger. Um, and for another, this is just, just a visualization. If anything, and there's a 98% chance I won't do this either, but if anything, I would show you this exact picture and then ask you how many calories are in an egg. And you'd have to look at it and say, oh, there's an egg. That's 100 calories, right? Just to make sure you can read uh, an infographic. But anyway... Let's move forward. We are done with the first main bullet point of the of the um, chapter, which is good because we're a little bit behind. The second main bullet point, the second of four, mind you, is when we finally talk about ATP. So like I said, if there's anything you remember from this chapter, it's that cells need ATP to do work, right? I'm giving you a bunch of information, but if anything, that's the number one thing to remember. Um. Chemical energy is released by a process called cellular respiration, and that is used to generate ATP. And I'm going to put another X through that, not because it's not important, but because we're going to that. This is chapter six. That bullet point is chapter six. Um, but yes, so the important thing here again is that you need to know ATP, right? You need to know that cells use ATP. So again, our bodies, our cells are converting that chemical energy of the food we eat to a different chemical energy, the chemical energy of ATP. And here's how you need to think of it. ATP, according to your book, acts like an energy shuffle or shuttle. And I think of it as a battery. I'm just gonna abbreviate here. I think of it as a battery, right? It's uh, ATP is like a battery, right? So you have all these little things in your cells that require energy to do their job. Well, you could almost think of it as they take little rechargeable batteries and the ATP, that's the rechargeable battery. Um, it stores the energy obtained from food, which again is why I like to think of it as a battery as opposed to an energy shuffle, because again, you eat that food, you break it down, you break down those molecules and you release that energy. And that energy is basically then used to recharge your battery, right? To make ATP. And then again, like I keep saying, your cell needs energy here and there for doing various things. And where does it get the energy? It gets it from that charged battery, which is what we call ATP. Um, and again, your book keeps reiterating this, and it is important. So as, as boring as it may be, again, energy transformations are essential for all life. So even if this is putting you to sleep, you know, this is life and death, really. This is why you're alive. Without this, you and everything else on Earth would not be alive. Um, anyway, any questions so far about what ATP is in general? So again, your book describes it as an energy shuffle. I think of, of it, uh, it's better to think of it as a battery, and you'll see why later because the whole concept of charging and recharging. But either way, I'm not going to ask you a question about 
what it is. There's going to be a lot of questions that involve ATP, but there shouldn't be any questions where I say, what is ATP? But, you know, you'll see as we get there. So and it, it, just think of it again at the back of your mind. Just try to think of it as a rechargeable battery. So let's talk about the structure of ATP, because as we learned in Chapter 4, there's going to be a lot of structure and function conversations this entire semester. Um, technically, ATP stands for adenosine tri phosphate. Um, you don't need to know that, so I'm going to put a bit of X to that, but there you go. Now you know that's what it stands for. Um, and basically what it is, uh, hold on, let me look at this before I talk about it. Yeah, I'm going to put a big old X through both of these. One, because the first bullet point I'm not going to ask you about, and the second bullet point I'm going to reiterate this later and, and explain it a little bit more in, in more detail. But ATP is an adenosine molecule that has a tail of three phosphate groups, as you can see here. This is the adenosine molecule, and this is the phosphate groups. And, of course, th this is the first time I'm telling you <laughs> I'm even – well, technically it's the second time. It's the second time I'm even mentioning the adenosine molecule. Not that you need to memorize this yet, but uh, I brought this up earlier when we were talking about biological molecules and we were talking about DNA – and they're made up of four different bases, A, T, C, and G, right? Those are the different types of DNA. Well, this is just the A. So I hate the way your book talks those this out there. And I hope you don't, you're not hearing me say this and think, wait, am I supposed to know what an adenosine is? No, not yet. But anyway, that's what ATP is made of. Um, and the way the energy works here is when you release one of these phosphate groups, you know, that releases the energy. Now, here's I'm going to break this down to you. You don't need to memorize this. This is just just so you understand how this is so energetic. Because you know, again, this is the molecule that we that every living thing uses for energy, right? So obviously, it's very energetic. So surely you guys see this. I won't even ask you what it is because I'm sure you know that is a negative, right? So we know those oxygens are negative. What I haven't taught you yet, and because you don't necessarily need to know it at this level of biology, is that Double bonds are also very negative because that's, you know, that's two pairs of uh, shared electrons as opposed to one. And electrons are negative, right? So double bonds are electro, very negative. Another thing that I didn't tell you that you don't need to know technically is that oxygens are very negative atoms. Um, so here we have a bunch of not negative stuff, right? Oxygens are negative. Double bonds are negative. These literally have a negative charge. And like I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about squeezing things together, these things are going to repel each other, right? These little balls are very negative. It's going to take a lot of energy to squeeze those things together. And like I keep saying, however much energy is used to build something, right? However much energy was used to squeeze these balls together, that's how much energy will be released when you break it. So just so you know, that is why this is such an energetic molecule. So any questions about that? Okay, that picture is not from your book. This is the picture from your book. And you can see why I chose that other picture because here that's just a ball. It's just a ball that has a P on it, right? You can't really see the double bonds or the oxygens or the negative charges, right? So you can't really tell that these balls don't really want to be next to each other, but they don't because they're all very negative. But anyway, so in a sense, going back to my analogy of batteries, this is a fully charged battery, right? It's got all three of the balls there. It's been fully charged. But then it releases the energy. And like I just said in the previous um, slide, how does it release energy? It releases it by losing a phosphate. Um, technically, it's transferred to another molecule. Your book talks a lot about that. I don't care. What I think you need to know is once this adenosine triphosphate loses a phosphate group, remember there's a lot of energy that's holding this bond, these two together. That bond has a lot of energy. So when you break it, that energy is released, right? Um, or that's what this is right here. The energy is released. So again, we go from a fully charged battery that we pop off that phosphate group. And now we have, I don't know, let's just call it a dead battery, DB. Why not? So again, that's how I think you should think of it. A fully charged battery and then a dead battery. And remember, these are rechargeable batteries. So now that we have this ADP, it's in diphosphate. Yeah, it's a dead battery, but we can charge it back up again. We can add another phosphate group. And we'll talk about that later as well. Um, so any questions about this picture? All right. 
So I'm going to go through this very quickly because like I just said in that last slide, your book talks about this, but I don't think it's that important for your level of biology. I'm only talking about it because your book talks about it. So like I said, the phosphate doesn't just plop off into space and disappear, right? It actually get, technically gets transferred. But in my opinion, that doesn't matter. What you need to know is that once that those bonds are broken, that holds those phosphate groups together, that's what releases the energy. But yes, technically it gets moved from one to another. Um, and your book also gets specific and talks about why is that useful? Well, it helps cells change shape. And there, I, I, drew, I put an example down there. It enables the transport across membranes. That's an important one, but there's no need to write it down because there's going to be a whole section in this chapter where we talk about that. And it also drives the production of cell of uh, large molecules. And that's important in a way, but we won't talk about it too much. But again, your body, need, your body, your cells need to build things. It takes energy to build things. Where does the energy come from? It comes from ATP specifically. And this is where it gets less important. It's because we are transferring one of those phosphate groups from one thing to another. Um, and there's a picture of it, right? So there's an ATP. We transfer a phosphate group that allows a motor protein, and that's how you move your muscles. Here's one that's allowing some stuff to come into a cell, and we're going to talk about this later in the semester or later in the chapter. Um, and again, we go from the fully charged battery to the dead battery. Same thing here. We're trying to build more molecules. We want to put an X and a Y together. That's going to take some energy. It does. We use ATP, which is the fully charged battery. We use it to make an XY. And then the byproduct is the dead battery, so to speak. Um, let's see. And the next word, the last word for attendance, you can barely see it, is tower. Well, let's just say clock tower. So if you're, if you're online right now, you can send me the word clock tower. If you're watching the video, you can send me a picture of a clock or a tower. And then also the last thing you need to do if you are watching the video as opposed to uh, watching this uh, live stream, like the video, and then take a screenshot that proved that you did. And I know that seems redundant and ridiculous, but I like to make you <laughs> like to make you jump through hoops if you're watching the video. So anyway, are there any questions about this or about our upcoming exam? All right. So I generally like to take weekends off, as I've told you, or that's a new thing. But anyway. And I'll probably do the same this weekend, but I will also try to look at my email a little bit more than usual this weekend because of the fact that we have an exam. So again, do the study guides and really, 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 I highly recommend watching the exam reviews. So for those of you who saw the exam review on Wednesday, you know why, right? And I'm not going to repeat myself because you were there to hear it. But trust me, it'll really help you to watch the other exam reviews, right? Watch all the exam reviews I have. Um, because there will be, there will be, a, let's, let's put it this way. There'll be one really, really, really hard, uh, nonsense question on the exam. Um, and the exam reviews will help you answer that. I'll just leave it at that. So anyway, are there any questions? All right. Well, I'm not going to log off cause I'm going straight to the office hours. So you guys can log off when, whenever you want. Don't forget to send me those words before 9 AM. If they're late, you will get, um, you know, half credit and don't share the words with anybody because I know who was online and who wasn't.